anything procedural, administrative, uh, random, libertarian in general. And by the way, also in addition to cramming a lot of material into six lectures, uh, tomorrow, uh, next week's lecture will be IP, which we covered in six weeks in another lecture. So we're cramming a lot in there. So this course, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, I believe. Okay, go ahead, Jock. General question on economics. Okay. You're starting a BA in economics, mainstream economics next year. Okay. So your background's only in heterodox economics. Okay, so what's the question? You know, I actually don't know if I'm the best one to, to answer this question. I, I'm a lawyer. I'm not an economist. I'm, I'm a student of economics, um, uh, although I have some opinions. I mean, I would say I do, think, I do think Murphy's course is probably the best one, to be honest. But, you know, I mean, I had two, a couple of economics courses um, in, in my engineering ma major back in college, and I just learned real economics on my own from reading books from uh, Rothbard and Mises and other things. So I think Murphy's book looks really good, to be honest. Um, I want to go through it myself with my son when he gets old enough. So I'm thinking that's a good starting point. But you're going to have to learn to poop out the regular stuff to these guys so that you pass. So... I would treat them separately, learning their economics and real economics. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, and Murphy has a really great interview with Jeff Tucker about the Mises Academy and his course, and he talks about how he basically learned economics by writing his book, and I believe that. I can understand that. Um, there are others, but I think he really tried really hard to distill it and to find a way to formulate it properly. Oh, you know what? I did not put the slides for this lecture on the course site. Let me email those to – Danny, are you there? I'll email those to you. Maybe you can do that while we talk. Um, um, give me just a second, guys. Um, I'm going to send these to Danny right now. Maybe he can upload those to me. Give me five seconds. Here we go. Okay, I'm sending these to Danny right now, so hopefully he's listening and can post them uh, while we speak. Sorry, I didn't. I meant to do that before. I did that last week, and I forgot to do it this time. Um, okay, so they'll be posted shortly. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about causation and some related things that we. Uh, I'm going to cover a few things that um, we left off of last time. And elaborate on a few matters. So last time we were talking about the legal system of a libertarian world, about uh, courts, private courts, anarchy, things like this. We talked about contract theory, and also um, I was going to get to why fraud is aggression, but I didn't have a chance to get to that. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. Okay, and there's a couple of things I wanted to just go over to, to, to emphasize and make sure I cover them in enough detail on contract theory. Um, so today I'll talk about some final things about contract theory. I'll talk about the fraud issue, and then we're going to go into causation issues. There's lots of issues related to causation. Okay. Now, on contract theory, if you guys remember, we were talking about the Rothbardian and Evers title transfer theory of contract. Um, we also talked about the problems of armchair – hello? Am I there for everyone? Sorry. And Danny, did uh, let me know if you don't get the file. It should be it should be received by you shortly um, for the the slides. Okay. So. Um, okay. Good. I'm back. Sorry about that. I just want to mention something in the conventional. Understanding not only is the conventional view that 
um, contracts are um, binding promises, right? Which I, d I discussed at the Rothbardian view is that they're not really binding obligations or promises. They're really um, ways to transfer title to property that you own. The al there's also a view that a contract is a piece of paper with words written down on it. Like that's the contract, right? But what you need to do is you need to think of the contract is really the um, the assignment of title to property. Now, how is that done? That's done because the owner who has the right to get rid of his ownership of something he owns is able to manifest his consent to let the world know or let the other party know that he's given up his ownership of it in favor of the other person. So basically it's a communication. It's, it's a manifestation of intent or consent. Thank you, Danny. Okay, so the slides are now up. The slides we're, look, we're using right now are now up. Um, so the contract can refer to the written document, but really that's just evidence of the party's consent. Now, I would agree that um, um, in, in a society we could expect that it would be customary to require a written agreement for certain types of contracts, um, such as the sale of land or you know, if, if you want to uh, – allow a physician to kill you for assisted suicide, you know, you, you could imagine that you would develop uh, formalities where you would require people to have written evidence of this just because of the danger of, of uh, proving you – know, a doctor doesn't want to be accused of murder. He's going to want to have solid proof that he was authorized to help a patient end his life, etc. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Contract is not, an, is not a piece of paper. Uh, it's just an evidence of what the party's intent was. Now, I also want to go into something here. I mentioned in the last class different legal systems. There's basically the civil law system, which is Roman law based, which is in place in most of the Western world outside of the English um, or the British uh, Commonwealth countries. Uh, and then there's the common law. I'm just going to use a civil law terminology here to discuss something. Um, there are different types of contracts, and, and I'm going to discuss this here. You don't really need to know this um, as a libertarian, but it's helpful to understand how modern legal systems classify contracts um, and contractual obligations. <clears throat> so the legal system says, well, a contract can be of many different types. They can be unilateral or bilateral. Okay? In the civil law, they say syn synalogmatic is another word for bilateral. So that's when two parties each give something up. Okay. Now, this terminology is not quite compatible with our libertarian analysis for reasons we'll see in a minute because they view contracts as binding obligations, Okay, or they say they do. A uh, contract could be onerous or gratuitous. Onerous means it's like a commercial con contract where each side gives up something. Gratuitous means it's a gift, basically, You know, like I agree to pay for my – nephew's college tuition. That's a gratuitous contract. Now, aleatory, which is an uncertain contract, uh, that's when the performance of either party is depends on an uncertain event. This is a key concept in the civil law, civil law of contracts, and I think it's really important for libertarianism as well, as we will get to. And if you want to go into this in further detail, you can look at some of the civil code articles in the Louisiana Civil Code. As an example, starting with Article 1906, just about five or six very short articles, very short code sections. It's, it's really fascinating to me and for anyone with an interest in legal theory, but I'm not requiring this as a part of this course. I'm just showing you this and trying to develop a terminology and to link what we think is the right way to look at contracts um, with the, um, the prevailing legal way of looking at contracts. Okay, slide six. Uh, now, here's what's important to realize. Every contract, okay, other than a contract that's contemporaneous, like a contemporaneous contract might be, I give you this teddy bear, you know, and as soon as I do it, I hand it to you, you have the title. It's, there's nothing future-oriented about it. Or, you know, um, I hand you a dollar bill and you give me a, a, a Hershey bar. It's a trade. It's pretty much contemporaneous, so there's no future element to it. But most contracts are not that simple. Most have at least one future-oriented element. So for example, in a loan, you give me money now, and I have 100% title to that money to use it 
for the purposes that I'm borrowing the money for. But what the lender gets is a, future, a claim to a future piece of property. But of course that's in the future. And because the future is uncertain, and this is a key Austrian insight, and if you want to look further into this, I have an article by Hoppe here. Let me turn on my laser pointer. Um, we've had trouble. Who can see my laser pointer right now? Can anyone see this? Who can see it and who can not see it? I'm just curious whether this actually works. I'm circling the word Hoppe right now. Yeah? Can anyone not see it? Good. It is red. Carl, who... I don't know if it's a computer type or a computer system, if it's Apple, Linux, or Windows is the problem, or what. Anyway, or it's a browser, Firefox, Safari, Window, uh, Internet Explorer. Anyway, um, there's a great article by great article by Hoppe. This article I have linked here, Uncertainty and Uncertainty, and he talks about how it is inherent in the idea of human action that the future is uncertain, necessarily uncertain. However, the future is not radically uncertain, as some uh, more of some types of Austrians and others might say, like Lachmann and others. Um, so we can know some things about the future, but we can't know everything. In any case, for our purposes, for libertarian theory, not Austrian theory, the point is that the future is uncertain, so that if you transfer title to a thing in the future, there is a necessary implicit condition on that obligation to transfer title, and that is that the thing exists or that you have title to it because it is certainly possible that in the future date in which the tr title is to be transferred, the obligee – I'm sorry, the obligor might not exist. He might be dead, or the thing might not, might not exist. It might have been destroyed or never acquired, or the um, – the obligee, obligor may never have um, uh, uh, may, may not have title to it at that time. But the point is, there's an uncertain aspect or an aleatory aspect to all contracts that are aimed at some kind of performance in the future. Now, I want to. This is in, this is something that you almost never see pointed out in law school or among legal theorists or. Uh, libertarians or political theorists because they don't have a clear idea of it or they don't do it. I find it helpful because I feel like I'm stupid sometimes, and I want to just break things down to the bottom level. So here's the way this works. An agreement is when you basically you know, have a communication with another party, and you say that you agree to something. Okay. Now, some agreements don't result in any kind of binding legal contract. You know, it might be a non-legally binding uh, agreement for some reason because it's uh, something inalienable or you don't specify with sufficient detail or there's no consideration or whatever. There might be legal formalities. But if you make a, if you have an agreement, and this can be written or unwritten, it has to be a communication some way, but it, it doesn't need to be a, a piece of paper. Typically it is. You have an agreement. If it's a binding agreement… That gives rise to a contract, and a contract is characterized by or gives rise to certain obligations. This is how the law looks at it. An agreement gives rise to a contract, which gives rise to obligations. Now, like I said, an agreement is not a contract, although those, use, those words are sometimes used synonymously. Um, so the agreement is a broader term than contract, so just keep that in mind. This is a good thing to know in the law, and even a lot of lawyers mess this up. It's good to keep these things distinct. Now, in the civil law and even in the common law, here's how they classify contractual obligations. What they say is when you have a, an agreement that gives rise to a contract, then it can, be, it can give rise to one of two types of obligations. An obligation to do, like to do something, to perform a service, or an obligation to give, that is to give something to the other party. Now, uh, and I explore this, by the way, in my contract theory article, which I have linked here, which I have uh, listed previously in the course um, materials. Now, here's what's important to recognize. In the Rothbardian theory of contract, all contracts are simply ways of alienating title to property. And what's important to realize here is that even though the the modern legal system uses a different a conceptual understanding of what, how contracts work, it really can be 
understood in terms of Rothbard's theory, and Rothbard's theory is not incompatible with it. The reason is this. Okay, if you have an obligation to give something, like a piece of property, well, of course, that's just a transfer of title to property. Now, if you had an obligation to do something, now, if the court system would actually enforce that obligation to perform with like an injunction, and they would put you in jail if you didn't sing the song you promised to sing or paint the things you promised to paint, then I would agree that the legal system would have two types of obligations it's enforcing. But they actually don't do that. Most modern legal systems are very reluctant to have what's called specific performance. Um, that is, the court will not force you to perform an action or a service that you promised or obligated yourself contractually that you would perform. What they will do instead is they will give an award of damages to the party that was promised the, the, the action or the service. So you know, if, if, uh, if I promise to sing at your birthday party and I don't show up, then you can sue me, and the, the court might order me to pay you $5,000 of damages for non-performance or whatever. But the point is you can understand that contract. The contract instead could have been worded as a title transfer contract. It could have been worded as if I don't sing at your – if I sing at your party, you will pay me $10,000, which is a title transfer. If I don't sing at your party, I will pay you $5,000 of damages or whatever. So basically you can understand even modern contract theory um, in terms of Rothbardian theory, which is, which is quite nice. Okay? Any, before we go on, are there any questions about that? Does everyone understand that? Achafalaya. By the way, why the name Achafalaya? I'm curious. I'm from Louisiana. That's sort of a Cajun name. Are you from Louisiana, Achafalaya? All right, I'm glad everyone's clear, but um, Nidon, I don't speak French, so I guess you're saying you're from Lafayette. Is that Louisiana? I'm glad I have a fellow uh, Kunas um, here. Kunas is the um, derogatory term, not derogatory, slang term for Cajuns in Louisiana. Okay, born there. Good. Um, Remind me of what the Faust – what is the question? Uh, go to his Faust contract. I don't remember Faust, the Faust contract. If you want to remind me what that is, I'll talk about it. I don't remember the Faust contract. I'll tell you what. You type it up, and I'll get to it if you – oh, uh, well, you mean just selling your soul to the devil? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, in libertarian theory, we talk about the real world, and we talk about the um, alienation or the sale of title to scarce resources that you own. And I just really don't know how to um, seriously analyze the sale of a soul because I don't think it's specified um, with enough realistic specificity to talk about it realistically. I think it's some kind of weird fictional metaphorical tale. Okay. So let's go on to slide eight. Maybe, but that gets us into an inalienability theory, and we have to talk about whether you could be forced to uh, enter into a um, uh, or, or to to go go through with a promise to. Part, let part of your flesh be cut off, Jock, or something like that. And as we discussed earlier, I would say if it's got to do with your body, then you cannot be forced to perform an action unless you've committed aggression. Uh, merely saying you will do something um, is not sufficient because you're just stating your future intent, but if your future intent changes, then it changes. And if someone else wants to rely on that, that's on them. That's, it's, it's at their risk to rely on your promise. And that's my perspective. Others believe you could sell your body like you could sell your apples, and so once you sell it, then you don't own it anymore, and you can't object to force being used against it. I don't agree with that analysis, but some do. Right. We talked about it last week. So let's go on to the next topic. Now, this is an, a really interesting topic. It's sort of an application. Um, this is an area that a lot of libertarians and others, in my view… Are not clear enough about, and therefore the discussion about it is always is quite often um, 
you're spinning in circles because people don't have a clear understanding of what they're talking about. So quite often libertarians will say that you know we believe in the um, non-aggression principle in which in which means you can do anything you want except commit force or initiate force or fraud or the threat of force. Now we talked about threat last time and why in my view threat can be included as a species of aggression. But what about fraud? Now the problem with is as I mentioned before Jock, I missed your oops there, so if I need to address something, just let me know. Um, the, the problem is, it is what I've mentioned before, a common mistake made in these kinds of discussions is the overuse and over-reliance on metaphors and the lack of carefully defining the concepts and terms you're using to discuss. Um, Barry, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, now, and also this can sometimes lead to either intentional or unintentional equivocation. Equivocation is when a term or concept is used in a general way, and you get someone to agree with it because they're applying it to a specific instance of that concept. And then they apply it in another way, and they say, well, you've already agreed. So, for example, a left libertarian might say, well, do you agree that um, aggression is wrong? Yes. Well, don't you agree that aggression is a type of oppression? And you might say, well, sure. So you're against oppression. Well, okay. But what you mean by that is you're against aggression. And then they'll say, well, it's also oppressive when um, you know, um, a father or, or husband doesn't let his wife do X, Y, Z, or doesn't let his or family doesn't let their children do X, Y, Z. That's oppressive. So if we're against oppression in general, we should be against that too as libertarians. So there's a kind of subtle use of equivocation in these cases. So this happens also with fraud, and you have to be really careful. Fraud is used sort of carelessly to mean dishonesty. Now, most people are against dishonesty to one extent or the other, but as libertarians, we're not necessarily against dishonesty per se as libertarians. What we're against is aggression or theft. So the type of fraud that we're against is when you a dishonesty helps you to steal someone's property, basically. Um, let me stop for a second and talk about Barry's thing. Focus on the presence of intent to create legally enforceable obligations. That link clearly to tort and criminal law as well. Well, we talked about that a little bit last time, Barry, uh, and that is sort of links in with Randy Barnett's consent theory of contract. Um, but my view is that your intent is manifested publicly, and if you're the owner of an object that you acquired by your intent to own it, either you homesteaded it or you purchased it from some previous homesteader or owner, then when you, re when you re reveal to another person or to the world that you want to abandon this thing, you want to give up your ownership, then that has effect because you've now severed your, your connection to this thing because you've abandoned it in effect. So that's how that intent basically works. It's not really an obligation. It's just the connection to a thing or the severing of a connection to a thing. Okay. So here's what Rothbard says. He says that aggression is invasion. Now, invasion means invading the borders of someone's property. Um, he says it has two corollaries, an intimidation or a direct threat of physical violence, which we talked about last class, or fraud which involves the appropriation of someone else's property without his consent is therefore implicit theft. Now, Rothbard uses this concept a lot. I think he's correct as in general, but I don't think he needs this metaphor to explain it, and it leads to some confusion when he applies it. Um, so what I would say is that fraud, the reason fraud is unlibertarian is because it stems from the right of contract or the right to own property. So let's take an example of what I think fraud is in the sense that we'd be prohibited in a libertarian society. So let's say you and I are going to have a contract where um, I pay you you know, an ounce of gold for a, uh, for a cartload of apples. Maybe a bad example. Apples are not that dear, but anyway, let's just say. Let's say I'll give you an ounce of silver for your basket of apples. Now, the, the implicit trade there is this. I will give you this ounce of gold now, 100% ownership for you, 
if you give me XYZ. XYZ is the specifications of what you told me the apples were, that they're actually apples. They're healthy apples, blah, blah, blah. Now, if I've got a basket that has rotten apples at the bottom, or they're full of worms, or they're plastic apples, and I hand these apples to you in exchange for the money, then I, as the seller of the apples, am aware that I am not fulfilling the condition for my receipt of the title to the silver coin. So if I deceive the seller, um, of the buyer, sorry, of the apples by this fraudulent uh, claim, then I am in receipt of property that I did not have a legitimate title to. Now I'm back. Am I here? Okay. The reason is, um, I think it's freezing for some people at their end, but it's not freezing for me. I know it freezes for me sometimes. I see it happen here. But in any case, let's keep going. Um, so you can see now in the law, there's a, a, a funny concept in the law called theft by trick. Theft by trick. And if you search for that, you'll see um, common law and other discussions of theft by trick. And in my view, this is all fraud really is, is theft by trick. Basically, it's the obtaining of possession or nominal title to something by means of a deception, which renders the permission that was granted to me uh, null and void. Because the permission is always conditional. So if I own the, uh, the, the gold coin, the silver coin, what I'm saying is I'm giving you this coin. Only based upon the assumption that you're telling me the truth, you're not defrauding me, you're not fooling me, you're not lying about the quality of the apples you're giving me in exchange, etc. So this is the origin of fraud theory. Okay, basically it is a uh, it is it is a uh, some kind of deception or lie that renders the consent, which is conditional. It, it makes the consent not happen. That's why. It's basically implicit theft. Okay? And this seems common sense. I think it's actually easy to understand, but this is not the typical way that this is explained. You cannot use fraud to mean, um, you know, um, I put a toupee on when I dated this girl, um, and, and so she thought I had hair, so I, I defrauded her into having sex with me or going out on a date. I mean, these are dishonesty things, but they're not really transfer of title. Yeah, actually, theft by trick, you can find it on Wikipedia. I didn't actually link it, but you can find theft by trick um, in the legal dictionary somewhere. That is an actual legal concept in the common law. A chafalaya, threats other than physical violence will be considered coercion. Well, I'm not talking about threats here. I'm talking about fraud. Threat we have covered last time. A threat basically is a communication that you intend to invade the uh, borders of someone else's property. A threat is, an, is a, a communication that you intend to or are about to imminently commit uh, aggression. That's not the same thing as deceiving someone to uh, obtain title to their property by false means. Okay. Uh, and by the way, before we go on to the next slide, I'm still on slide eight. At the bottom here, I'm talking about some examples. Um, just think about how you could use property that you own. So let's say I own a, um, I don't know, this 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 bottle of water here, and I tell Barry, "Hey Barry, I hereby give you this bottle of water in one minute." Well, if I do that, that's a unilateral contract. It's unilateral, but it's aleatory because it's future oriented. But it's automatic in the sense that in one minute, now that I've already alienated the title, in one minute the title will transfer to you, but only if I still own it. I mean, if lightning zaps it in two seconds and it's gone, there's no bottle of water left, right? You can also do other things. I could say, you know, Barry, if you go to Oxford College next year, I will pay your tuition. Now, you're not giving me anything in exchange, but if you fill the condition, I have transferred the tuition money to you. Assuming that I own it, and you can do tons of interesting combinations. This is what contracts are. This is what lawyers do and would do in a free society. They would use this ability to have conditions and communications. 
Okay, next. Um, now, I want to go into a little bit of a, um, um, a slight problem I think Rothbard has in his contract theory. Because remember, Rothbard believes in inalienability. Uh, Walter Block doesn't, and Walter Block's a um, – okay, Tr Trey's asking about asymmetrical formation and Rembrandt. I think basically it is the job of the buyer to ensure that he's getting what he wants. But if he is really promised something and he relies on it, I think that uh, it's technically fraud, even if he shouldn't have uh, been so stupid and you know so careless or whatever. I think – Carl, I think it was just froze on your end for some reason. Sorry about that. In any case, um, let's look at Rothbard's examples of implicit theft. So on page 78 – I think this is Ethics of Liberty, sorry um, – he says Smith's going to pay $1,000 for Jones's car, okay? but Smith takes the car, but then he refuses to pay the money for it. He has, in effect, stolen the $1,000. Okay, So let's think about this case. Smith and Jones agree that Smith will pay $1,000 for the car. Okay, So then Smith takes the car, but then – this is not fraud because he's not, he's not um, giving him bad dollars for it. He's basically refusing to turn over the money that he's agreed to turn over. So what I would say is that as soon as the car was given to him, he owns the car. But now the $1,000 in his bank account or wherever is owned by Smith – I'm sorry, by Jones. If he refuses to turn it over, he's in, he's in receipt of stolen property in, a, in effect. Everyone got that? Okay, so what does Rothbard say? So, so – he says is he's in, he's in effect stolen the one thousand dollars. That's correct, and it's important here to think: what has Smith stolen? Has he stolen the car, or has he stolen the one thousand dollars? I would say he has stolen the one thousand dollars because the deal was he gets the car, but then one thousand dollars of his money is transferred to um, to Jones in payment. And if he refuses to turn it over, he's stealing the one thousand dollars. Okay, so that's important. And Rothbard is correct here, I believe. Let's go to the next slide, slide 9, slide 10. Okay. Now, sorry about that. Um, okay. So, um, now, but when Rothbard talks about a loan, Here's where he kind of he kind of gets this backwards, and so does Walter Block, in my view, um, when he applies this idea. So think about a debt contract, okay? Rothbard says that the debt contracts are enforceable not because the creditor's property is stolen um, if the debt is not paid, okay? So in other words, let's take an example. Brown lends Green one thousand dollars now, okay? So Green's the borrower. Borrower, sorry. In return for eleven hundred dollars, which is like a thousand plus ten percent interest next year. So if Green fails fails to pay, if the borrower fails to pay, he has stolen eleven hundred dollars of Smith's property. This is what Rothbard says, and that's why Rothbard says that debtor's contract, a debtor's prison, is in theory justified. Now he says that it's um, disproportionate, so he's against it because it's disproportionate. But he says in theory, if you're a thief, you know you could be punished. And so debtor's prison is in debtor's prison is in theory justified. So if you don't pay a debt, you're in theory committing theft. Okay, Alexis, we're talk talking now about a loan between Green and Smith. So Rothbard was right. I mean, let me go back one page. I believe he was correct in his example of Smith and uh, Jones in the car. I think he's correct. What was stolen was the amount of money that. Um, uh, Smith was supposed to pay. Okay, he, he didn't pay what he was obligated to pay. But in the loan example, what Rothbard says is the 1100 – so what I'm saying is this. In this case, he switches to what's being stolen. So Green owes $1,100 a year from now to, um, uh, to Brown. 
if he has it, I would agree with Rockbard that he has to pay, repay it because now the ownership of that eleven hundred dollars has transferred to the lender. But if he does, and if he refuses to turn it over, then you're in possession of stolen property. It's a type of theft. But if you do not have the money, let's say you're bankrupt because your plans for the use of the borrowed funds didn't pan out. Okay, it just doesn't make sense in my view to say that there's theft. There's nothing to steal, right? If um, if Green is bankrupt, what eleven hundred dollars has he stolen? So the problem with saying it's theft is that there's nothing to steal. It just doesn't exist. Remember, all future promises are aleatory or uncertain. And if the if the property to be transferred doesn't exist, then it can't be transferred on the day of the alleged assignment. And if you don't transfer something that doesn't exist, how can you be blamed for it in the sense of theft? Okay. Now I've talked with Walter Block before, and they they switch back and forth. They'll say, well, then it was the original one thousand that was loaned that was stolen because it was fraudulently used because it was not repaid a year later. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The one thousand dollars was given unconditionally. If it wasn't given unconditionally, then it could not have been spent and used, which is the purpose of a loan. right? And not only that, you cannot wait one year to find out who owned the $1,000 back in the original point of the loan because according to libertarian property theory, we have to know who owns something at every point in time so we can know who's the owner of it. Now, Collins, now that's a good question, Colin. Can Smith force Green to sell $1,100 or the assets. Um, I would agree. Sure, he can because we can assume that there are accessory contracts or implicit obligations or, or, or secondary title transfers. So in other words, we could say that on the date of the original loan, Green said, in one year I'll pay you $1,100, and if I don't have it, then you get $1,100 worth of my other property. And if I don't have that, then you get $1,100 plus interest in the future whenever I acquire it. But the point is these are all subsequent title transfers, and so, so, um, um, so Barry, no, I would disagree with you. There is no obligation. There's just a, a sequence of title transfers. Yes, I think the money is still owed in the sense that there's going to always be a title transfer that would attach, but the point is it's not theft, and it's not fraud. This is what's important to understand, and Jock, I would agree. You could look at it as a lien, but again, that's just a title transfer to property. Matthew, I don't think they have to make a new contract because I think the original contract would be understood to have um, uh, conditional you know, accessory obligations or title transfers that, that cover all these, these things because this is a typical problem. right? But the point is it's possible you're never going to get repaid. Sometimes people write off loans. The question is for the libertarian, is it theft? And is it fraud? And it's not fraud if there was no de deception in the beginning, and it's not theft if there's no property owned on the due date. That's the important point in my view. Okay, Lauren. Now you, uh, I'll try to get to that later in this lecture about fractional reserve banking. You're saying if the money is warehoused and they're supposed to hold it but they invest it. Well, in that case, if you warehouse money and it's clear that the depositor – retains title to the money or the depositors retain title to the money uh, in general, then the bank, if they invest it, they're actually what's called conversion, stealing. I think that actually is stealing. You cannot loan someone's money out if you don't own it. So we have to be really clear about who owns the money that's quote-unquote deposited. So it, it all depends upon the nature of the contract, the deposit contract itself. Is it really a loan? by the so-called depositor, or is it a, a real deposit uh, by the depositor? It depends on what was agreed upon. Carl II, it's a, a tort. Um, I don't think it's a tort. A tort is the um, negligent um, invasion of someone else's property. But if you have agreed previously to transfer a title to property that you may or may not own in the future, and in that future point in time, you don't own the property, so there's nothing to transfer. I don't think a tort has been committed, actually. Basically, what's happened is an event that triggers another title transfer, an event that triggers a future title transfer of future money of mine if and when I own it, which is equal to an amount equal to the original debt plus interest. 
So basically, it's all title transfers. You've got to think of it like that. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, I have something here about fractional reserve banking. Let me go over this really quickly for people who are not familiar with this debate. This is sort of debated heavily associated with the uh, George Mason uh, University type Austrians. And what they believe is that in a free society, in a free banking system, when you loan – when customers loan money to a bank, they would agree to let the bank loan some of that money out so that they could get interest on it. Steve Horowitz, etc. Yes. Um, and um, they think the system would work and it would be stable, etc. And they think there's there's economic reasons they give for why it's necessary. Personally, I disagree with them. I agree with the uh, Rothbardians, like Murray Rothbard, uh, Guido Hilsman, Hans Hermann Hoppe, Walter Block, these types. I think that money should be sound money, and it's either um, it's either money or it's not. Now, this is my economic view. I personally believe that if fractional reserve banking was tried, it would just be a disaster, and it would it, they would go bankrupt. But I'm not opposed to that. I mean, I I don't even think uh, as a libertarian that uh, Ponzi schemes should be outlawed. I mean, I I think that if you want to invest your money in a risky scheme, you have the right to, as long as there's no fraud. Now, the second question, and more pertinent for our purposes here, is the libertarian question, and that is, is fractional reserve inherently unlibertarian, which means is it inherently fraudulent? Now, I tend to agree with the Rothbardians who oppose fractional reserve banking that in historically it tended to involve some types of uh, unlibertarian regulations or deception. And that in, even in a free society, there would be a temptation to deceive your customers. But I do believe personally that it is possible to disclose clearly to a customer the nature of the contract, and if that customer wants to engage in it, they're entitled to do so, and there is no fraud. Uh, but legally, what you would do is you would classify this as a loan or a credit arrangement, not as a warehousing thing. So I think you need to make a decision. When you put your money in the bank, you have to make a decision. Is this a deposit or what you might call a warehousing function, or is it a loan? If it's a loan, then the bank owns the property, and you're just, you just have an op the bank has an obligation to pay you future money, which they may or may not have, as we mentioned. So you're taking a risk. Then the bank loans the money out to other customers – not to other customers, to other – lenders, and they make a return or they might not, might not make a return. Um, if they have a bunch of loans go bad, they're not going to be able to repay them. Um, Barry, I know that's, Barry, I know it's a common view among some Rothbardians that fractional reserve banking is counterfeiting, but counterfeiting – I really can't go into that too much here. I think we're going to run out of time, but counterfeiting is a type of fraud. So what counterfeiting is is passing off something to someone and deceiving them of the nature of it to get title to their property. So counterfeiting is is theft by trickery, like we talked about earlier. So there's nothing wrong in libertarian theory with printing a piece of paper that has anything on it. Okay? You can print whatever you want in your own house. You can print a perfect copy of a dollar bill, a perfect copy of the Rothbard bank note, whatever. The problem comes when you use it to spend it. When you try to spend it to pay someone for their service or for their good, and when you tell them this is a genuine note. If you disclose that it's a fake note, no problem. There's no fraud, so there's nothing wrong with counterfeiting. So the only problem with counterfeiting is that if and to the extent that it's fraudulent, in my view. Yes. Uh, anyway, we have, to, we have to go on with this, but this is, this is how I look at this issue. Free banking is prone to fraud. Free banking from an Austrian perspective is unstable and probably would not last in my view, but it is not inherently fraudulent as so long as there's full disclosure. And by the way, full disclosure would include what's called a suspension uh, clause, which says the bank has to tell the customers there's a chance that if you try to redeem your loan early, we might not be able to pay you because… We can never be 100% sure that we're going to have enough assets on hand at a given time to redeem your note. 
So as long as they do that, that's fine. And I think that's an implicit um, condition. Uh, unlike some fractional reserve bankers, they think that you could arrange your affairs so that you can guarantee you could repay. But I think it's impossible. If you're loaning the assets out, it's impossible to guarantee um, that you could repay every every um, customer's demand to get paid early. Because if there, it, in other words, it's possible to have a run on the bank. It is possible to have a run, right? And if there's a possibility of a run, that means that you have to have a suspension clause, either implicitly or otherwise. Now, personally, as a libertarian, I don't mind putting that on the depositor. Looking at it caveat emptor. If you're stupid enough to give your money to a bank and they tell you you're going to get interest, you should know that it's going to be loaned out. That's a different question about who should have the obligation of making the relationship clear, but I do think that is a relationship. So in my view of the libertarian perspective is that fractional reserve banking should be permitted so long as there's not overt fraud. But my view as an Austrian is that if the bank is forced to be clear and not to commit fraud, then the fractional reserve banking scheme could not get along for very long. That's my personal view as an Austrian. Okay. Yes, Jock, and I am um, very close to some of the Cobden Center people, um, Toby Baxendale and the others there, and I agree, and I helped draft the, um, the Carswell legislation that you just linked to, and um, I would hope that it has a chance of making some change in British banking law to make the law more sound. Okay, any questions about FRB before we go on? Okay. As usual, running behind. Well, that just means you guys are getting good bang for the buck. Okay, let's go to slide 12. Okay. Tell you what we're going to do. I think we're all going to run over, but I, that's fine with me. We can do questions uh, if we don't have time for them today. I think we'll have time for questions today, but not a lot of time. Let's get to the final topic for today. I think we can cover this in… I think we can cover this in 15 or 20 minutes, and then we can have a few minutes for questions. Once again, you guys are getting a 75-80-minute um, <laughs> lecture. This is kind of cool. Um, okay. Now, I wrote an article with Patrick Tinsley, who's a fellow a lawyer and an Austrian libertarian, and a few years ago, and it talks about this issue, and it's on the course page. Um, the reason we wrote this is because there's sort of been um, – as I've mentioned before, one of the typical problems in libertarian legal theorizing is that libertarians often don't have a sophisticated view of, 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 of law, although the sound on libertarianism, so they can only go so far. And lawyers have the opposite problem. They know about law, and legal theorists know about law. But they don't have a sound political theory or economics, so there's always a gap. So there's, there's actually a lot of room still for um, for work to fill in these gaps and to close these gaps. So one that we tried to uh, close was the following issue. There are some comments by Rothbard. I mean, th there's a lot of talk about what's called strict liability, when you should be responsible, um, and we, you know, libertarians tend to have a pretty good idea of when you when you should be responsible for your own actions that cause direct harm to other people. But if you think about it, let's imagine um, um, I shoot Jock with a gun. Now, if the gun the bullet enters Jock's head and kills him, um, why am I responsible for that? I mean, I didn't enter his body; the bullet did, right? Sorry, Jock. I hope you don't mind me using you as a guinea pig. If you do, uh, this can be your your twin, your evil twin brother, Jock, Jock Prime. But um, the point is, what we all say is that, well, I actually caused Jock to be killed. I caused Jock's head to be used in a way he didn't want to be used. That is a bullet going into it. Okay, and in fact, some of the penal uh, codes, the the uh, the legal the legal codes specifically say this that. It's a crime to cause X, Y, and Z to happen to someone's body. So this is an, this, the idea of causation is always implicit. Now, the problem is the theory has not been expanded. <laughs> so 
what you have is you have Walter Block and Murray Rothbard, two of my favorite theorists, by the way, and, and Walter's a good friend. Um, and they will say that, well, you are responsible – the question is this. When are you responsible for other people's actions? That's the question. When are you responsible for other people's actions? Now, there's a word for this in law. It's called vicarious, vicarious liability. Uh, let me type it here. Vicarious. Okay, and one example of that is called respondeat superior, which we'll get to in a minute, which means you're responsible vicariously for the torts committed by your employees of a company. But that's just one example. The question is when are you responsible for the actions of others? Now, let's clear up one thing here. L let's take a typical case. Um, uh, President Truman orders the Air Force to bomb Hiroshima with a nuclear bomb. Exactly. Hitler's a good example. Did Hitler actually kill anyone? Did Charles Manson actually kill anyone? Uh, or did he just persuade his cult followers to do it? Did Truman actually kill anyone, or did he just say something, and it ended up rippling down and causing some bomber and a pilot and a bombardier to drop a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and kill 100 and X thousand Japanese? Okay, so… Uh, or if a mafia boss orders someone to commit a crime, a hit a hitman, who's responsible? Or if a wife who wants to kill her husband pays a hitman to kill her husband, is she is she guilty? If she has a lover and persuades her lover through uh, just persuasion to kill her husband for her, is she responsible? Now, these questions always arise. And one thing I think we need to clear up is this. One problem – some libertarians and others will say, um, well, let, let's take the wife example. Well, if she persuades her lover to kill her husband, then if we give her the responsibility, that absolves her, her lover, and that's not right, so we can't do that. Well, the mistake there is that there's this assumption that there's like a 100 percent pie of responsibility, and we have to allocate it to different people. So if we give her some responsibility, like like 90 percent, then the hitman or her lover only has uh, 10 percent left. Well, this is obviously nonsense. The, uh, there's nothing wrong with the idea – I mean we're individualists as Austrians and libertarians, but it doesn't mean that we don't believe in joint or even collective action and cooperation. Sometimes you can have joint action to achieve a goal, and so if you have… You know, five bank robbers conspire and come together and to rob a bank. They have each contributed to the robbing of the bank, and if a bank teller is murdered during the course of the robbery, each one under the current law is held to be liable for the murder. Okay, uh, and that is the correct result, or something like the correct result, because it's not like there's a 100 percent guilt that's there. They each are 100 percent guilty. That's the libertarian view. Okay, So we have to get rid of this idea. So in other words, we have no dilemma to solve here. We don't have to choose between the guy that orders the crime and the guy that carries it out in direct action. Maybe they're both 100 percent liable. Okay, So what we have to do is we have to think of it this way. We have to realize that crime is an action, and this is another example of why Austrian theory and the, the praxeological approach to the structure of human action can help to inform an intelligent understanding of libertarian um, uh, ideas. So crime is an action. What that means is it's, it's the use of a means. Now I say efficacious here in parentheses. You can see efficacious here because this is the idea of means that cause something to happen. They have to be efficacious. Uh, if I stick pins in a doll… Using voodoo to kill you, that's not really efficacious. I mean, I don't believe in magic, so I don't think it's efficacious. So it's not really causing your death. I might be trying to, the intent is there, but I'm not causing it. Uh, that's a good, actually Danny's comment here about will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? I think that's a good example. Let me let me get to that one in a second. That's a great example. Um it's an example that shows the poverty of an ad hoc analysis. I mean, 
so Walter Block and Murray Rothbard would say that in general, incitement is not a crime. Like inciting a crowd to riot, for example, is not a crime because it's merely free speech. However, there are two cases, according to uh, Block, for example, two cases where you are responsible for the actions of others. Let me go into the next page. Um, well, I have it here on this page. Number one, if you pay them like a fee, you have a contract, or if you coerce them. And the problem with this is that these are like two sort of ad hoc exceptions that they're not undergirded by any kind of systematic theory. And they don't really make any sense to isolate them this way. Let me go on to slide 13. Um, in my view, the, the way to look at this is, is it's aggression to cause the initiation of force or the trespass or to invade the borders of someone's property or to change the physical integrity of someone's property without their consent. That's an uninvited change. Or to use their property without their consent. That's basically ways of looking at what aggression is. So the question is, did I employ means to achieve this end of using their property without their consent? Um, and I discuss this in de more detail in my article that I have linked here, what libertarianism is. And you can look at footnote 11 and surrounding text in the, in the text, etc. Um, and I already talked about the gun example. So now what's important here – let me go to the next page. Mises points out that humans can be means to action, and we all know this. right? This is what the division of labor is. The means is normally a scarce resource in the world, a gun, a shovel, a knife. Whatever, something that can achieve your end of killing the other person or whatever. But you can also have joint action. You can use other people as means. This is why we have the division of labor, and this is why, in my view, there is no reason to rule out um, joint responsibility for collective action of a crime. Okay. Um, Look, I have on the optional readings of, for today's course a, a great article by Adolf Reinach. He was a brilliant German phenomenologist and legal theorist, quasi-Austrian, who died in World War I, I believe, um, but who wrote some brilliant stuff before then. And I published one of his uh, unpublished articles in my journal a year and a half ago. Look in the course notes for that. He gives some great examples. We had a whole symposium about his thought. At Mises Institute about um, seven or eight years ago, and that's where my causation article stemmed from, actually. Um, so, but let's let's, and he has lots of great examples. I may get to some of these later if I have time tonight. Uh, but let's go through some of the examples we talked about earlier. Um, as I mentioned, saying that the only exceptions to this incitement rule, saying incitement is okay and um, um, is not a crime. But there are some exceptions, like if you coerce someone or others, there's problems with that. Number one, it's ad hoc, as I mentioned. Um, the other problem is, I mean, we cannot assume that uh, a general or a president or a, a chief commander is always necessarily coercing the bomber. I mean, maybe they do it because they want to. I mean, if if you basically said, if Hitler had said, or if Truman had said, um, I hereby absolve that I will not punish anyone who disobeys my orders and then carried on. You can still have a military structure, and he still might have been able to bomb Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So would he be off the hook because he wasn't coercing these guys? I don't think so. Um, the other problem is uh, if you say a contract is an exception, well, the Austrian view of contract is that it's just a transfer of title to property. So it's not really a binding obligation, and furthermore, the only thing this matters about that is that the person receiving the transfer, the title transfer, values it. But value is subjective. So, you know, I, a hitman, or or a, let's let's, say, let's take a lover of a of a wife. He may value getting sexual services from her, or even just pleasing her, 
as much as he values getting a dollar bill or a hundred dollar contract. What's the difference from a libertarian point of view? If she can use the promise of sexual favors or just her influence over him in general just to be pleased, just to be pleased by his actions, or to pay someone a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to bump her husband off, what's the difference? She basically used him as a means to achieve her goal, which is to kill her husband. So she's responsible in either case, in my perspective. Uh, now, Patrick asks about a, a newspaper uh, and says someone should kill him. See, I think this gets into the gray area, and so does the case about uh, that Danny mentioned about, um, uh, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Now, in the newspaper, I think that's on the gray area. I don't know how to answer this. This gets back to our armchair issue about how much can we save from our armchairs. I think that we have to look at the context. I think in some cases maybe publishing an article saying uh, Muslims should be killed or whatever. Maybe that's incitement that should be responsible. Maybe it's just free speech, but we have to figure it out. It depends upon the intent, the means, and the structural nature of human action. But that's the question we put to the jury. That's the point. Um, and the fat wall – exactly. My view as a libertarian is you always, if possible, take the side of the victim. So if Salman Rushdie is killed, I'm going to take his side as much as possible, and I'm going to blame the guy that kills him plus the people that induced him to do it. Now, there's going to be limits to this, of course, but the point is you know, if you see a mob rushing towards a guy, and you know he's innocent, and you say, kill them, and, the, and you stir the mob into action, and they kill this guy, of course you're causally responsible. If you get on the witness stand… And you say, that guy robbed my store. Excuse me. And you're lying, and you get this guy convicted, and go to, he gets put in jail. Yeah, maybe the judge is guilty too. Maybe the jury, jurors are guilty. Maybe the prison guards are guilty. That's a different question. But are you guilty for playing a causal role and having him incarcerated unjustly? I think obviously yes. Now let's take another example. Let's say… I put a bomb in a FedEx package, and I have it shipped to my victim, and he receives it, and he gets killed when he opens it. I'm liable, but is the FedEx delivery man liable? He had nothing to do with it. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't intend to do it. So you see the structure of human action is intent to achieve an end using a means. So I intended to kill my victim using the means of a bomb and a willing courier agent. But the courier didn't intend to kill anyone, so he's innocent. Maybe he's negligent, but he's not innocent. Maybe he violated a contract, but he's not he's not a murderer like I am. Okay. So now some people say, well, mere speech act should no. – if you remember, we talked last time or the time before about Rothbard's view that there are – all rights are property rights. So for example, this right to free speech is not an independent right. The right to free speech is just a consequence of the right to own property, so you don't have the right to speak on your neighbor's property, which you would have if you had a right to free speech. So obviously there's only property rights. Not only that, as this example shows, some types of speech are not free at all because if they play a role in the commission of aggression, they're, also, they're not permissible. If you tell a mob, lynch that guy, that is a type of aggression. If, you, if you're the head of a firing squad and you say, ready, aim, fire, and they fire, or if you're President Truman and you say, drop the bomb now, these speech acts play a role in aggression. So the question is not whether it's speech or not. The question is whether you perform an action that is causally efficacious at causing other people's uh, property or bodies to be harmed um, when they're innocent. So this is the basic idea, and I think it's a very powerful idea. How it can be explored and applied is a different question, but I think this is the way to approach it. Okay, let's go to slide 16. Before I go to this, Jock says, um, a recent death row case in Texas about a driver… Who never left the car during the robbery in which someone was killed? Well, so this is a question of like um, someone who's an accessory to a, a joint crime, right? the getaway car driver. Now, my kind of uh, 
my kind of a, a, a simplistic approach to this would be first to choose between the victim and the and the people that are committing the crime. So if I have to choose between the getaway car driver and someone who was harmed during the murder, during the robbery, or murdered, or the, the victims of the theft, I'm going to choose the victim. And I'm going to look at this group of people that join together to commit the action as all guilty. And then it's up to them to come up with arguments for why some of them are less liable than others. Now, there's a rule in the common law called the felony murder rule, which I think is basically justified on libertarian grounds. That is the rule that if you are a co-conspirator of a criminal – of a crime like a bank robbery, and one of your fellow uh, conspirators commits an intentional action like murder, let's say, then that – is transferred to you, you're liable for that as well because you're part of the felony that commits it. And I think that's actually justified, um, and I think that would apply to getaway car drivers and the the guy sitting at home who planned the whole thing, who's directing it. Of course they're all responsible for this, but you could not implicate them using this sort of ad hoc theory of um, – hold on a second, John. You, you couldn't use this… If you had an ad hoc theory like Block does where you say, well, you're not responsible for mere incitement. You're only responsible if you have a contract or if you coerce someone. I mean that's just too narrow. It needs to be more general. Um, now, as for first degree, that's the common law breakdown of crimes. right? First degree is premeditated, say, murder. Now, there's a, there's a doctrine, say, in common law called transferred intent. So if I'm – let's say I'm trying to kill Jock. <laughs> Jock is the victim tonight. Um, so I'm pointing a gun at Jock, and I'm trying to kill Jock. Now, if I succeed, that's first-degree murder. But let's say I miss, and the bullet hits um, Amanda, who's right behind Jock. So what the common law will say is, well, the, the, that will still count as, as a first-degree murder of Mary because the, the intent to kill Jock is transferred, transferred intent. I think that approach is basically justified too, uh, as it is in, in, in the conspiracy we talked about before. Okay, now um, Mary Surratt's culpability during Link, uh, uh, regarding Link. I've, this sounds familiar, but Danny, I don't remember the details of this. Um, didn't um, not Oswald? Who's the guy that killed Lincoln? Yeah, John Wilkes Booth. So what's the thing with Mary Surratt? I can't remember this, the details there. Anyway, if, if someone wants to type it, we can we can talk about that. But um, let me go into the slide here. Um, we're actually almost out of time, so I'm, I want to use the remaining eight minutes to – I think we're actually doing pretty good. We always go over here. But we have enough time to cover the remaining slides. What I want to talk about is one final topic, and th th this is related to what we've been talking about tonight and in other lectures. You will often hear um, um, people, including libertarians, say that, well, property rights are limited because you don't have the right to use your property to, com to commit a crime. Now, this idea is used by like Oliver Wendell Holmes. Look at the bottom here. Um, He'll say that, well, free speech is not open-ended because you, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Well, of course, you can shout fire in a crowded theater if there's a fire, so there's nothing wrong with that. But as Rothbard pointed out, the problem with shouting fire in a crowded theater when there's not a fire is if is because it violates the implicit rules set down by the owner of the property. In other words, the property rights are paramount. So that's another uh, mean, uh, another false uh, idea there that's used to, ju to limit property rights. Similarly, you'll have non-libertarians say, well, you libertarians believe in uh, unlimited or absolute property rights, but that makes no sense because we all believe in limitations on property rights. After all, you can't use your gun or your fist to punch me in the nose. The problem with this idea is that it assumes that it's because of a limitation on property rights that you can't shoot someone or punch them in the nose. Rather, the truth is the reason that you should not 
or may not punch someone in the nose or shoot them is precisely because they have property rights in their body. In other words, the prohibition against performing this action is based upon the assumption of property rights. And in fact, it's a limitation on action, not on property rights. So for example, according to libertarianism, I am not permitted to shoot you with my gun or with anyone's gun, even if I stole it. It has nothing to do with who owns the gun. So the prohibition on me shooting you is not a limitation on property rights at all or whatsoever. That's an important thing to remember because this canard is trotted out time and time and time again. Uh, Erica, um, yes, Jock, he says that, and that's a common formulation. But the thing to remember is it's, it's really a talking about what actions you can perform. The basic idea is you can perform any action you want except you cannot commit aggression. It's not a limitation on property. It's a limitation on your actions. Okay, now let's get quickly to this topic. This is not in an, that important of a topic, but let's just go into it and see how far we can go. I want to get to corporations really quickly. Uh, you know what? I don't think we're going to have time. Let's let, tell you what. Let's stop here because I want to get to corporations. It takes more than five minutes. And since we're almost at the end, I'd be happy to stay longer and talk, uh, answer questions, but I don't want the main lecture to go more than 90 minutes. So we're at, we're at um, 85 minutes right now, so I will stop here on, lecture se on slide 17. We'll pick this up next time in the next few minutes, and then we'll talk about IP. So I'd be happy to talk for several minutes with any, uh, to answer any questions anyone has. So feel free to type some questions here. And I think I've answered every question uh, to date in the, um, in the question in the, in the course materials. So if I missed any, please call them to my attention. But otherwise, I'll just wait for any questions to be typed here or any links. Any? No questions? Everything clear? We have time. Come on, Jock. You have you have one question, I know. And mental illness, will they be liable? Um, again, I think this is a um, a, a great area type question. I mean, the, the basic idea is that if you intend to use a means to use someone's property without their consent, that's a crime. If it's partially intentional, we call that negligence, right? Um, and again, we can address this next question because strict liability has to do with this issue of mens rea, which uh, a chapel I asked about mens rea. Mens rea is evil mind, right? Did you intend to, co to commit harm? Um, Carl, do we have property right in our actions? I, I think we do not. I think your actions is just what you do with your body. I think you, you, it's better to say you have a property right in your body. You have the right to control your body, to use your body in general. You can't use it to invade someone else's rights, but you can use your body however you want. And that gives you the practical ability to act as you like. But to say you have a property right in your actions is like saying you have a property right in free speech, which is sort of redundant with or double counting um, or treating the right to free speech as an independent right when it's really a consequence of the right to property. Yeah, I mean Jock's right. I would say basically if you're a, a mental mental, you know, if you have mental problem that is reduced culpability. Yeah, Jock, I agree. Um, it, it's just like that. It's about it's like labor too. And the, the problem is this metaphor of labor is very powerful, but I think you have to realize labor is just an action. Something you do with your body. So, do you own your actions? What does that even mean to own your actions? I mean, we know you own your body, so you can do what you want. So, what what would it mean to own your actions? Can you put it in a jar and sell it? I mean, I don't know what that means. Trey, we talked about Truman's action of ordering the bombing of Nagasaki. 
where do the taxpayers that voted for him and pay for the bomb, and how does this work in a total war? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know the answer. I, I mean, I have my own personal views. I think there's a spectrum of liability in society. So let's take let's take a more concrete example. Let's say that you, Trey, are convicted in court of uh, smoking marijuana, and you are put in jail. Now, you could blame any different numbers of layers of society for this. You could blame the judge. You could blame the jailer. You could blame the employees of the prison system. You could blame the guards in the courthouse. You could blame the jurors. You could blame the citizens who voted for people um, who enacted the drug laws. I mean I think responsibility is spread among all of them in different ways. How you figure it out, I don't know. But my personal view is this. Um, the juror, in, at least in the common law system, when the jury has the right to vote to acquit with almost no consequence and no liability if they vote to acquit, and there's double jeopardy so that if you vote to acquit, the guy can't be tried again, I think that the final line of responsibility lies with the jury. So if you're on a jury and you actually vote to convict someone of an immoral or unlibertarian crime, you are the… You are the one person with the most discretion that could just say no because voters are one of millions. right? Um, prison guards are hired. They're going to do what they're told to do. Judges don't have much discretion. If they don't obey, the rules are going to be forced out. The one person in our system is the jury and the voter. I think voters – excuse me – are responsible too, so I think they're responsible, but they're not like – there's so many of them that it's hard to hold them all responsible. But I think it's basically a crime to vote to convict someone of committing a non-libertarian offense. True, the jurors are slave labor, but they are not punished for, depending upon how their verdict is. So at the point in time where they can vote guilty or innocent, they should say innocent in my opinion. Now, Matthew, your question regards strict liability actually, which is what our next topic will result in, um, and we'll have to talk about that next time. Yeah, Spooner might say that, Jock, but I don't think that it's a contractual issue. I think it's a causal issue. I think that the juror um, helps to – if you vote to convict, then you're causally responsible for the, for the incarceration of an innocent person. Um, which is why I think you basically have a duty as a human being to refuse to participate in that kind of situation or to vote to vote innocent. Yeah, you know, well, that's the FIJA, Fully Informed Jury Association or Amendment, FIJA, is the idea that jurors should be informed of their right to acquit, at least in the common law systems, the American and the common law systems. Yeah, they do. They do tell you that. I agree with that. So if you know, if you if you don't understand, right? If if you're a juror who doesn't understand that you have the option to um, to vote to acquit, then that might be uh, you know an amelior ameliorating factor. But I'm just saying if you know the system is that you do have the right. You just don't know it. Yeah, this is the consequence of having double jeopardy in in the common law system. Which means that you cannot try the the court system cannot try the defendant twice for the same crime, and the idea that the the jury is not liable for how they vote. The combination of these two legal rules means that you do have the practical ability to judge the law. Oh yeah, I know that that's the, what's going on right now. If you if you if you tell them you're a libertarian or whatever, you don't get on the jury. I've had that happen before. I've 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 been excused in a in a cocaine case because I said I could not I could not vote to convict this poor woman um, for selling cocaine. But then she was probably convicted because they select out everyone who's opposed to the system. But I would say those people committed a crime against this woman. Why would you vote to authorize the state to incarcerate an innocent person? 
maybe they're innocent to some degree. Maybe they should have, you know, they're they, they've been duped. Yeah, I think I agree, Jock. I think it's it's a practical matter. It's going to be harder um, to find um, juries for certain types of cases. You talked about limiting liability to 100 percent, but it, 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 doesn't there have to be at least 100 percent? Um, if I understand your question, I would say yes, it has to be 100 percent if it's a crime, if it's an actual crime. Sh someone is liable, but let's say that someone is 100 percent liable and someone is 10 percent liable, and the, the, and the, the main guy is gone. And we can only find the 10% person. Well, then, then that's all you can pursue for that person. Yeah, Jock said uh, the pilot still would have dropped it. Of course he would. And he, he didn't drop it because he was coerced. I think, I think Walter's wrong about that. Walter Block is wrong in assuming that these guys do this because they're coerced. I, I mean, yeah, sure, maybe if he disobeyed orders, he would have gone to, to military prison, but that's not why they follow orders. They follow orders because they basically agree with the mission of the institution. Well, it depends on what – Jim, it depends on what you mean by 100 percent. I mean I, I'm assuming 100 percent is whatever is the uh, uh, proportionate – you know, proportionate result. So, by definition, it's got to be 100 percent. But I'm not saying it's got to be, uh, you know, uh, equal to the damage that was done to the victim. I'm just assuming a certain type of uh, damage or a certain type of award that should be granted. Yeah. Well, look, I think we should go. There's no more substantive questions, but I enjoyed the class tonight, and I will see you guys on Wednesday. And uh, and I'll see you again on Wednesday. So I'll see you on Wednesday. Good night, everybody.